go off and then I'll introduce you, that would be great. Hi everyone and welcome. I'm so glad you're joining us tonight. We, we're, we've been running through the beginning of summer here at the first two weeks of June to kick off summer with you and for you. And we've had some special guests over the last two weeks. We, we, we shared some great information for the South Coast and the interior and the Kootenays and Vancouver Island. And tonight we're so pleased to be talking to you about, and hopefully you're from Northern BC. And, and most of us don't get to spend enough time there, uh, but our guests here have been there. Some of them are there tonight and they're familiar with that, that landscape and, and what's involved in outdoor recreation in that region of our province. And, and they're gonna share some incredible things with you. But before we kick off, I just wanna go through some house, housekeeping, introduce you my, to myself and our crew um, and let you know how the night's gonna run. Um, I'm the executive director at the BC Adventure Smart Program. I'm, I'm grateful to be joining you tonight from the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people. Behind the scenes tonight, we have Natasha. She's our assistant coordinator and, and working the tech part of our presentation tonight. And if you have any questions for us, please put them in the question field and Natasha and all of us are here to answer those for you as we get through our speaker series. This is GoToWebinar, so you're automatically muted, unfortunately, and you're automatically, um, your camera's off. But we can communicate through the question field and, and afterwards as well, because you'll all get a recording of tonight's session that you can watch again if you like or share with your friends. Just a little bit about Adventure Smart before I introduce our first speaker. Um, we've been around for 17 years. Some of you may know about us, others maybe it's the first time joining us online. And, and we were started by the BC Search and Rescue Association 17 years ago. And the main focus is to, was and is, still is, to increase awareness for outdoor enthusiasts so that we can hopefully reduce the number and severity of search and rescue calls in the province. Every year in BC, there's over 1,700, 1,700 search and rescue calls in the province of BC, and 79 search and rescue groups with 2,500 volunteers respond to all those calls. It takes a community, it takes a village, it takes industry, it takes partners and supporters, uh, First Nations, uh, um, outdoor recreation leaders to work together so that we can uh, manage risks for you, help you get informed before you go outdoors. That's our tagline, by the way. And, and so our team here, we have weekly webinars every Thursday. Uh, we rotate through our programs for adults, for uh, seasons, for children, paddling, backcountry. It's really fun. Every Thursday, we've got something going on. And then also at Trailheads on the weekends, we place our staff um, where the high call volume area is based on the season. And, and you could see us at busy trailheads throughout the province, depending on what season it is. And all of that information is found at adventuresmart.ca. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dylan. And for Dylan Ayers, hunting has always been about two things, creating a community around food and connecting with nature. It's a philosophy he picked up from a long line of hunters, and it's one that he's proud to pass on to new generations. With a growing interest in learning to hunt from folks from non-traditional hunting communities, there is a gap in mentorship and support for this growing community. Dylan established Eat Wild in 2011 to support the non-traditional hunters to find their way to becoming ethical, safe, and successful hunters. The most challenging thing is getting out into the wilderness and getting the skills and the confidence you need to figure out how the animals live and how to harvest them, says Dylan. Developing those skills can take years, but it's always worth it in the end. Dylan shares his knowledge and passion for hunting through field workshops, uh, with learning to hunt webinars and videos and the Eat Wild hunting app and the, in, the very famous Eat Wild podcast. So grateful to be welcoming my friend and, uh, and uh, smiling face, uh, Dylan, the stage is yours. Well, Sandra, thanks so much. And thanks for inviting me and uh, to be part of this. I, I'm excited about this because I spend a lot of my time in Northern BC. I, I truly value the wilderness areas. We, there's a, we were so fortunate to have some intact wilderness areas to explore and enjoy. And as a hunter and a fisher and someone who gathers wild food and is passionate about that way of life, um, I'm very fortunate to get to explore those territories and uh, and hang out on those lands. Um, I'm joining you tonight uh, from the traditional territory of the Musqueam, uh, the Tsleil-Waututh and the Squamish First Nation peoples. And I'm, I'm very 
fortunate to live and work on these lands and I also get to hunt, gather and fish on these lands as well. So I'm, I'm very privileged in that sense and uh, um, very lucky to be here. So, uh, so Sandra asked me to chat about uh, sort of safety stuff related to hunting I, and I thought that was great I, I if you're if it's a northern group I, I generally I would imagine a number of you are ex at least exposed to the hunting community living up north uh, in my years of going to university I, I grew up in Vancouver uh, in, in a very much a non-hunting community and nobody hunted and when I went to university in Prince George at UNBC um, it was amazing because all of a sudden like I could talk to people in and around town and they and they, they weren't like they they didn't think i was a weirdo because i hunted uh, and, and i was you know i was passionate about it too so it was, it was great to get to the north for my university years and i still stay very connected with the community i built there and come back every year and explore all those beautiful areas as i said so what i thought would be fun to talk about i've got 15 minutes and i i thought it'd be fun to talk about some of the gear that i take with me on every one of my hunts that I go on, whether it's a day hunt or a 10 day expedition hunt uh, in the Northern Rockies somewhere. And the, I'll walk through the, those elements and those the, 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 that gear uh, and tell you why I pack it. And, and, and a lot of it just comes back to, you know, ultimately being prepared for say, having to spend an extra night out because you maybe got you turned around and someone's got to come look for you or maybe you've got an animal down in the bush and it's going to take you a lot longer to get out than you'd planned for um or maybe you just want to hang out for another night and want to have enough gear to hang out there for the night so you can get after it again first thing in the morning if you're onto an animal or something like that so these these are scenarios that happen pretty often for for us in the hunting community but ultimately being prepared so you can be out there overnight or weather storms and also be able to communicate out to folks as to um, where what your status is and stay connected to your hunting partners or folks back home who have a trip planned for you. So I'm gonna walk you through those. I got a few slides to share with you, so I'll, I'll, I'll share the screen. But what I should mention is I do have a couple of cool things. I have I have a, a Eat Wild butt pad um, to give away, as well as an Eat Wild t-shirt to give away. Now, I'm not just gonna give it away, I'm gonna, ask you to answer a trivia question at the end of this it's going to be based on some of the material that we've talked about in this short webinar uh, i think sandra's going to come up with one or two questions i'll maybe come up with one and uh, you can we ask the question and then you got to type in the right answer and the first one to get it gets that awesome prize so let me get into it while we got the time all right hopefully you're looking at a screen a screenshot of a couple of folks out hunting. Great. Looks like we got it. Great. All right. So we've been doing a series of, I mean, you know, we typically do, do lots of our engagement and stuff through live, well, in-person uh, web uh, webinars, no, in-person workshops where we take people out in the field and teach them the skills associated with hunting to help them build confidence and, and the skills to be out there and be successful, ethical, and, and safe hunters. And Obviously, things have changed. So here we are, uh, uh, a year or so into this pandemic, and we're still sort of we're learning to build relationships and educate, you know, and build community and and relationships online, as well as doing our uh, our doing our, our our teachings and such. So we've developed a series of learn to hunt webinars, which have been a lot of fun because I'm able to build relationships and connect with people all over BC and Canada and around the world now. And it's been fun. So this is just a building block of another presentation, which I think people will value just some of that planning around uh, what to bring in your pack. So this is a nice picture of a bunch of gear that I that I laid out on the floor. I just dumped my pack out. And when I dumped it out, it just happened to all fall into this perfect alignment. Uh, that's not true. That took me lots of time to configure that. To, to make it look just like that. But anyways, there's lots of things in there that are super important for my day kit. Now, this is the stuff that I put in my day pack, whether I'm jumping out of the truck to look um, into a logging slash or just going for a five minute hike to check something out. I bring all of this gear because at any time that five minute hike down the road could turn into chasing a wounded animal for, for five miles um, or you know, just having an awesome experience that ends in a successful harvest, and then you're you're basically dealing with a large animal in the in the field. And you want to be prepared for be able to be able to do that, and be prepared to stay out overnight or if you need to. So I'll walk you through some of these things that I've got in my pack. First and foremost, 
I think your navigation and your communication devices are essential. Now, there's been huge innovations in both of these, like the tools that are available to uh, all of us who spend time outside. Number one is our cell phones. The cell phones have a their great communication device and the mapping software inside of phones is is amazing. Whether you're using Google Earth or you, we, I use iHunter a lot because it's got a it's got lots of functionality that's great for hunting specific applications like a private land layer. But it's also got the GPS software and a mapping program that allows you to drop waypoints and navigate using the app. There's Gaia, uh, there's uh, lots of other great software that if you build a relationship with that software and get to know it, train on it, it can be an amazing tool for navigation and finding your way around in the woods. Um, now the caution is, is that if you're relying on your phone for navigation, that you have to have your battery management figured out. So I always have a backup battery system and a charging system for my phone on, even if it's a day trip. Um, I never rely, if I'm lying on my phone, I need to have a reliable backup battery source to keep the phone charged as long as I'm planning to be out. On expedition trips, I typically bring a small um, uh, solar panel that seems to keep my phone charged up. Now, the other tool that we have for communication is the, the in-reach or satellite communication devices, such as the spot device. This has been revolutionary in the sense that I can now text anybody anywhere in the world uh, using that little orange uh, uh, unit in the middle there. Very light uh, piece of technology to add to your kit. It actually tethers to your phone and it turns your phone into a, a texting device that can then text through the satellite service. So if you want to communicate to get help, say, um, obviously you've got that tool. You can send complete messages saying what the situation is, where you are, that type of thing. All right. Uh, of course, radios are still are super great to just keep in touch with with your uh, with your hunting partners or 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 to to also they're great for traveling on forest service roads and knowing what the, what trucks are coming. There's a frequency there you can program into your phone into those radios to uh, know about what what traffic is coming down on those logging roads. Um, okay, so invest for sure in secondary battery power as well as look into that. Uh, uh, the, the 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 availability and the technology of um, the inReach device. Now, I would never go anywhere without my compass because at the end of the day, the compass provides me orientation to where I am at any one time. So I have my compass in my pocket. I look at it regularly and I rely on it to let me know, to orient me to where I am. Okay, I got a few things here in this slide that I rely on for sort of overnight stuff. So. If you look here, I've got like uh, the bottom left corner, and I'll get through this here. Well, there's a there's a couple of things I should point out. Headlamp, I always have an extra headlamp in the bottom of my pack, and I make sure that I actually turn one of the batteries around so it so it actually won't turn on by accident. And when I want to use that one headlamp, I turn that one battery around, and now it make it it creates the circuit, and it, and I can know that I've got a fully charged headlamp available at the bottom of my pack. I've got some tape for for part of my safety kit and as part of my repair kit, as well as a first aid kit, an emergency blanket, some flagging tape. Those are all key things that I need to have. But with the time I have, I wanna talk about um, the importance of having, being able to ride out a storm when you need to. So this is a, this is actually just drop this slide and we'll see if it works here. Um, the other, last year we were on a sheep hunt and we climbed most of the way up the mountain and, and camped just at like, six or seven thousand feet six thousand feet and we decided we we're going to go for a quick uh hunt up on the ridge and we wanted to go light because it was extremely steep mountain so i left behind my tarp and some of my extra layers because i just i knew i was going to be hot and, and i wanted to be light and quick and why did i ever make a mistake because uh this is what we got up to the top of the ridge and we looked off to the yeah, to the west, and this was coming at us, and it was coming fast. So huge winds, uh, hail, heavy, big raindrops the size of my fist, just smashing down on us as we were totally exposed on the edge of this ridge. And sure enough, we we see three rams that are on a hillside within range of trying to be getting to them. Um, so we were committed to waiting out this storm to, to have another look at those rams, and uh, of course without the appropriate gear we got awfully cold and wet we ended up um 
finding this little crack in the rocks here. We huddled underneath here and we took one garbage bag that we happened to have and cut it cut it in half and be able to tuck it around us and at least keep the the, the hail and the rain off us a little bit to, as we waited out the storm. So the important thing for me to, to reinforce there, there's a few things that I need to have with me every time now and never leave behind. One is that I loved having an insulation layer, that, that down puffy jacket. You can compress it down, put it in the bottom of your bag, weighs about a pound. And when you need to stay warm, pop it out of your bag, throw it on before you get cold. Now, the next thing is, of course, having um, your shell, your rain gear is so important to have good quality rain gear that hasn't worn out. Like rain gear has a lifetime. Gore-Tex has a lifespan. It only survives so many storms. So I typically have relatively new gear uh, when I'm going to rely on it to be in the mountains and in, in those sort of really uh, volatile conditions like that. So that's so I just take good care of it. Make sure your Gore-Tex is clean and the waterproofing is still intact. Um, I, I also have a shell for my pants as well. So between the shell, the down, uh, you know, I can stay warm, dry and comfortable, but you know what, still, as much as Gore-Tex works well, nothing beats having a tarp to sort of drape over top of you in a, in a pinch or to string up between a couple of trees to actually make a fairly comfortable environment to sit around and wait out a storm. So whether I'm just waiting out a storm or whether I'm you know lost or disoriented and stuck somewhere overnight and waiting for uh, those amazing volunteers to come and find me, I'm gonna have a tarp set up over top of me. I'm gonna have my warm clothes layers on. I'm gonna have my Gore-Tex on. So I'm gonna be able to retain my body heat and stay warm and, and wait things out. The other thing I wanna be able to do is I wanna be able to make a fire to keep me company. Now, if it's not, if it's, of course, there could be fire bands here anywhere in BC during the summer, but if you're outside of that area, have your little fire starting kit. I use a couple of Bic lighters or my kit and a candle. Um, I've got a couple of videos online about how to start a fire in the woods and how to cook over a fire that breaks down my technique for starting fires. You can check those out. Of course, um, when it comes to hunting stuff, I, I, I always bring everything that I need to properly deal with an animal so that you can get the guts out, you can skin the animal out and you can start the packing out process so that you can you know, take care of that animal, treat it with as much respect as you, uh, as it absolutely deserves. And, uh, and you don't have to like, you know, shoot an animal five kilometers back in the woods and then be like, oh, I don't have my knife or I don't have my kit to start to deal with it. So you want to be able to have your knives, your knife sharpener, uh, some, some game bags or some plastic bags to sort of maintain a clean environment and, and get to work on the animal uh, and take good care of it. Um, and of course, lastly, I mean, you know, that there's, I could talk forever about optics and rifles and spotting scopes, but I, you know, I really do, I mean, I, I, I take my binoculars everywhere I go because I rely on my binoculars for helping me find game. I, um, uh, I take a spotting scope with me almost everywhere I go because I just absolutely love watching wildlife. So whether it's, it's a little bit of extra weight, but it comes with me everywhere I go because I typically like looking at stuff, so. Okay, so that's sort of the essential stuff that I can share with you in the time I have. So I hope you enjoy it. I, I, there's a video that we'll share with you in a link about a little bit about you know what, getting lost or getting unlost, I say, and uh, what to do if you get stuck out overnight. And we talk about using some of this kit and it's uh, shared with you in a bit of a video. If you want to know more about, uh, I actually have on my app, I have a, a gear list. So if you go, if you download my app, you can get uh, all of my camp lists or gear lists, it's all in the app and you can click on them. It's kind of a cool feature as well as get access to a bunch of our how to hunt videos. It's super fun. And if you want to hang out with me and my Eat Wild mentor team, come back. We're doing, um, I think we're doing our next Learn to Hunt webinar is Meat Care in the Field. And we talk all about how to take care of the meat in the field uh, through the webinar format. Lots of cool slides and videos and usually bring together a bunch of mentors to talk about their experience as well. So it's lots of fun. And then when things get back to normal, come join us for a field workshop and have some fun with us. Oh, yeah, and we have the very, very exciting podcast that Sandra was recently on. And we had a lot of fun catching up on old times and talking safety and SAR. So, all right, I'll leave it there. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to hang out for a couple of questions. Thanks, Dylan. That was awesome. And um, Natasha, jump in any time. I think you have mentioned to me that there might be some questions already queued up and and uh, I've come up with my questions for the giveaway. So uh, yeah, Natasha, any questions from the audience?
Yeah, we have a couple here. Uh, we have a great question from Jill. How much does your pack weigh fully loaded, Dylan? Uh, it depends how many days I'm going for. I, you know, and I, and I, and when you actually weigh everything, like you weigh your gun and your spotting scope and everything, your for a 10 day hunt like i i think i can do it for about 52 pounds for a 10 day hunt and that includes all of my kit uh not including the clothes i'm wearing or my boots on my feet um but yeah that but it's pretty like i bet you just the, like just the hunting day hunting kit alone is probably 20 pounds or something it's it's not especially if you throw the spotting scope in there that's like seven pounds altogether or something so excellent this is a great question from simon how do you recommend hunters stay safe and check in when most don't want anyone to know their secret spot? I've been trying to figure that out forever. You got to have a very, tr so, so actually what I do is the people that I leave my information with are, are my old hunting mentors. For one thing, they, they're, they won't go into panic when they, when they like, when they get a message from me saying, Hey, I've got a bit of a, a problem here. Uh, and uh, I, I need some help. They're not going to go into panic because they, like, they know likely what the scenario is because they've been in it the, themselves. Uh, also, now they're too old to get into most of my secret spots anyways because they're all old and busted up knees. And I'm probably hunting in one of their secret spots anyways that they handed down to me. So just leave, just leave your trip plan with somebody who doesn't isn't likely to hunt your spot. Awesome. Can um, I can I add to that, uh, Natasha and Dylan? Please, I remember please. Dylan when we did your podcast, we talked about that a little bit, right? I remember we were talking about trip plans and secret spots, and no matter what it is, you know, maybe it's a secret ride that I like to go for on my bike or stuff. But the Adventure Smart Trip Plan app, and I I let you know about this too, Dylan, is that you can leave all that information on the app, and it only stays with your emergency contact. So your spot could still be secret if you if you'd like it to be. And but if there is an emergency, then it's there and ready to roll to send off to police for RCMP, which then gets uh, handed down to search and rescue. So the app is a, a great little tool there. Cool. Are we out of questions? Sorry, I muted myself and then was just talking at my muted microphone. Uh, my apologies. Uh, we have another, we do have a great question here from David. Um, he's asking, is the stuff you showed, is it pretty much standard in all regions? This, the, the, as in the gear and such? I um, believe so. He just, he doesn't really elaborate on which stuff, so. Sure. Oh yeah, no, for sure. And I think that's kind of the, the message that I, it's the lesson that I've learned over time is that like, whether I'm going for a little wander uh, in the grasslands around Kamloops, which I would I would see as fairly benign country, or if I'm in the northern Rockies and sheep country, I just I just make sure that I bring all the kit that I need to survive a night out, and 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 just be prepared for the worst, even if it's summertime. Like heck, two years ago, two two years ago, we went uh, we flew into the Cassiars and the Taltan territory, and we were on a, a, a caribou hunt. Uh, in in the middle of October, like 25 degree summer weather, and the next day we we ended up sitting in our tent for five straight days. It was actually we were stuck in our tent for seven days. Well, it it a winter storm just arrived, an Arctic storm, and just dropped like four feet of snow on us and <laughs> crazy winds. Like you just it's so unpredictable, British Columbia. You can get in so much trouble so fast that just bring the kit, even though you're packing on a little extra weight. And in the end, you just get a little bit more fit because you get used to carrying 20 pounds around everywhere you go. Um, yeah, I noticed that whenever I hang out with my buddies that are from SAR, they have these like tank backpacks, like just super heavy backpacks because they basically got everything they need to go respond to a SAR call wherever they go. And they're just become programmed like that. And then they get to look like Dave, you'll see in a little bit here. They're just built like, yeah, they, it's very strong. <laughs> I'm packing that stuff around all the time. Awesome. And another question here. Um, how did you get into hunting? That's, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I I grew up in a in a family. Uh, my my grandfather is uh, is Métis, and 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 our family has has hunted and fished, uh, and that's just how we grew up. And um, so my my both my grandfather is my mother, and we all participated in our family hunts, and uh, we hunted moose and 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 fished for salmon, and uh, and that's uh, it was just I grew up on it, and I, of course fell as I got into my teenage years, I just really enjoyed the everything that had 
everything comes with hunting and just not just the food, but the connection with, with community and outdoors and um, just hanging out with animals. I just absolutely love it. And uh, so, yeah, I've been a, a passionate hunter since I, I can remember. And, uh, and as a way of life for, for us that we rely on. Awesome. I believe Sandra's going to pop in here um, and ask you a couple questions, or she has some questions for the giveaway for the butt pad and the t-shirt. Nice. You have two questions? <laughs> did you, do you have two? I did. I was making notes here. Come on. I, okay, I was go for it. Well, you got to, to, okay, let's do the t-shirt first. Okay, so, okay. okay, so just make sure everybody knows what they got to do. They got to type in the correct answer. Um, and uh, and we'll go for the t Eat Wild t-shirt. You have to let Natasha know your size. And uh, okay, go for it, Sandra. Okay, there were two things that you mentioned that you don't leave home without. So they don't just have to list one, they have to list two. So there were two things that you said. You said them at separate parts of your presentation. So they need to tell us what both of those things are. Both are great pieces of gear that Dylan doesn't leave home without. That's question one. Okay, let's see what comes up. Can we can we can we see what some of the I, I imagine there must be some answers in there by now. There there definitely is. They are firing in here. Um, <laughs> I have the I know what it is. So I don't know what it is. So <laughs> <laughs> you better I, maybe some, you some, do it, you, subjective. You do it habitually, yeah, you do it habitually. You're like, what did Sandra pick? <laughs> Sandra, so the answer, uh Wow, this is interesting. Okay, can we hear some of them? Yeah, we definitely can. So we have um, we GPS and communication. We have battery backup and compass, communication and navigation devices, cell phone backup, battery and compass, compass and a down jacket, uh, communications and layers, compass and an extra battery, Communication devices and compass, communication device with spare battery and headlamp, uh, game sighting scope, GPS phone, a tarp and communication devices, cell phone and extra battery charger. All right, Saturn, why do you, why do you tell us what, what you have? What were you gonna go with? What were your two? This is good, this is good. So those were all really valid answers. My answer to that was, you don't go anywhere without your compass. That was one of the first things you said. It was in the picture there. You're like, you don't leave home without it. And the other one was binoculars. I remember you saying that it was binox. Oh, so okay. you had yeah, those you're... those two things. So, um, so should we do will, a third question anybody's... then? Should we do a third question since no one got it, that nailed it? Because you were right. I did say I <laughs> always hunt with my binoculars, and I always have. So they were the most emphasized. So. So if any, did anybody that's get? What, that's what Sandra heard. <laughs> well, and I and I do agree with you. So we'll have to we'll get a little bit more fun, and we can get out one more question. So I'll ask my question, and we'll go back to you, Sandra. So I'm going to go for another question for the T-shirt. And what are the two things that I have in my fire building safety kit? I can see it now. Yeah. yeah. People probably got it pretty quick, so we'll see. I so it is the candle, and 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 if you, and you could actually, if you said two big lighters, that I know I said two things, but you have a candle and two big lighters. So, um, yep. So the first person to say a candle and two big lighters was Hunter Meyer. Hey, Hunter! Congratulations! Woo! So Hunter gets a T-shirt. Um, so Hunter, uh, if you could send us an email, info at adventuresmartbc.ca, um, and we will get you all hooked up with a connection to that T-shirt uh, from Dylan here. Absolutely. There, there's lots of ways to build a fire for sure. I just, I just got taught to use uh, a, a candle as a sustained flame to help dry out the tinder and eventually ignite it, and always bring two or three big lighters. Um, because they're better than waterproof matches, and uh, they, they don't. And if you have two or three of them, one of them will eventually work. Okay, Sandra, for the butt, this is the. So I should feature the butt pad. I didn't actually say this in the 
it, 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 it's one of my most critical pieces. I would never go hunting without it. But this is a highly technical engineered foam. It will not absorb water. So it'll keep your butt nice and warm and dry when you're sitting down on a stump or a rock and just enjoying in nature. Uh, great for all users. Uh, lots of people use the, the Thermarest version. This is a bit lighter, a little more palatable, a little bit you can stuff it in your bag. So um, anyways, the Ewell butt pad. Go ahead, Sandra. Okay, I thought this was unique and it was something I hadn't heard about before. So maybe someone could answer quickly. Can you tell me what one of the apps that Dylan uses? He mentioned a few. There was one in there that I hadn't heard of. I just looked it up. Some of the ones that Dylan talked about, I have heard about, but maybe because I'm not a hunter, I didn't hear about the other one. So if you could guess what that is, let us know. Yeah, right. awesome. Cool. So yep. I bet you that was the iHunter app. Was that yes, the, it was. Came up great. Yeah. Daryl Godley was the first person to mention iHunter. Uh, oh, so cool. thank you very much, Daryl. Uh, send us an email again, info at adventuresmartbc.ca, and we'll get you all hooked up with your butt pad. Cool. All right. That's that's excellent. So that 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 iHunter app is uh, we partnered with the iHunter group there to to build. Uh, we're building. Uh, I uh, learned to hunt webinar um, for navigating in the woods using that platform. And uh, so it'll be a great resource. So I'll uh, be sure to share it out with uh, the Wild community. So, all right, I'll sign off. I think you want to get rid of me, don't you? <laughs> well, not really, but yeah. Okay, go. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, but if you want to find me, uh, uh, reach out to us on Instagram. That's probably where we're most active and, and staying connected with our community. And you can message me directly if you have any more questions around uh, hunting stuff. And and if you want some help getting started on hunting, we'd love to help you out. Um, and as Sandra said, we do lots of stuff, whether it's workshops, courses, YouTube stuff, it's all there. But um, yeah, come check us out or just go to our website, eatwild.ca, and you'll see lots more stuff. So, all right, I'm looking forward to the rest of the show here. Thank you, Dylan. That was a pleasure. It always is. And and again, Dylan is is a, a true friend. He's not. It wasn't just part of the intro. He's uh, him and I have been friends for over 25 years, uh, and we used to be park rangers together. And he still is. I'm not, obviously. But thanks, Dylan. That was a pleasure, and I learned a few things there as well. As we move on to our next guest, I'd just like to thanks, Dylan. I'd like to introduce you. Um, I'll read you a little bit about Anthony. Anthony is uh, he comes from the Niska village of Git Winsink, located in the northwest coast of BC. He currently is employed by Nishka Lissim's government uh, as an emergency response services manager. There he provides direction of emergency management and business continuity, as well as providing strategic guidance and continuity and corporate knowledge to ensure legal compliance of the Emergency Program Act and health and safety legislation for the Nishka Nation. He also manages a 10-person Niska Wildlife Fire Unit crew, currently Type 3 crew, contracted with BC Wildfire Service since 2019. Recently, Anthony spearheaded training and development of the Niska Nation, joining a new initiative from the Canadian Coast Guard known as Coastal Nation Coast Guard Auxiliary, and that was in April 2020. This is First Nations-led program for six coastal nations along BC's coast, and lastly, Anthony has been developing a program with BC Emergency Health Services and Northern Health Authority to start a Nishka version of BC Ambulance within the Nass Valley. In turn, training and hiring up to a dozen licen licensed Nisca emergency medical responders that will service all four Nisca communities. I'm so pleased you're here, Anthony, and I can't wait to see your presentation. Welcome, and I look forward to your presentation. All right, so thank you very much. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes, we can, thank you. All right, so thank you very much, Sandra, for the introduction. And so I'd like to start uh, with an introduction in my language. So, Lachskik ni wilps la will witwe. Get winter will a tagai. Niska nation will tagai. Though exitnism samagit laha dem amasat noon. Scott ni dem doy exit samagit laha will ginama amasat gun lam will dip sight wandit. 
Gwyna. Dim Gelksik Gwyk Gan Gegek Sim Zerkdit Saga Get Hatlask Awish Gush You Hadayat Ni Pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Anthony Moore. I come from the Niskat Nation located in North Coast BC. I am from the Eagle Tribe in the House of La. I live in the Niskat community of Gitwin Ksilk. My name is Yanam Balan Skatnist, translated as Foggy Belt Around the Mountain. I want to thank the Creator for this wonderful day today and bringing us together um, safely. We got through the hard times, and this job was very important, and, and it has now been over a year for this pandemic. So what I'm speaking to this, uh, this evening is specific to the Niska, but the trends are similar to other First Nations communities uh, around the North uh, that surround our territory. We have seen our culture thrive, adapt and endure. Our cultures is, ours is a world yeah, teeming with inlets, dense forests, sleeping volcanoes, and it is a land that is much a part of us as our own flesh and blood. Through, through this land and our, our lives is Lissoms, the Nass River, as it has become known in modern times. The resources of the Nass River help sustain our people for a millennia. This bounty allows us to develop one of the most unique and sophisticated Aboriginal cultures in North America. One of these, one with a rich legacy of arts, crafts, dance, and oral history. Today, the Niskat Nation includes over 6,200 people residing in the communities of Gilachtamix, Gitwinksishk, Lachkaldzap, Gingolch, and some in the urban areas such as Terrace, Prince Rupert, and Vancouver, and across North America. We are a treaty people. In 2000, our leaders brought home the landmark final, uh, Niskat Final Agreement, British Columbia's first modern day treaty. This agreement marks the return of self-government to the Niskat Nation. It means that we are the masters of our own house once again. Our success has inspired Aboriginal people around the world to work towards a just and negotiated settlements. We Niskat are leaders. Our art and culture celebrates our ties to this land. We have stories to share and encourage visitors to experience these stories by exploring the Nass Valley and all that our land has to offer. From guided volcano hikes to fishing tours and traditional cedar hat and blanket uh, weaving workshops, the Nass Valley offers an un unmatched experience for adventure and cultural travelers to enjoy. And Clodixum Lachmich Ash Gwyn Gask Niskat, the Niskat Memorial Lava Bed Park, the first provincial park managed jointly by a First Nation and British Columbia, offers us uh, spectacular natural features and a dramatic introduction to the Niskat culture. The Niska Alkali Basalt Flow is one of the youngest and most accessible volcanic features in the province. With a 16 site vehicle campground, picnic areas, visitor information centers, boat launches and short hikes, the park offers a wide variety of activities and a chance to learn more about Niska culture and the natural history of the region. The Niska Alkali Basalt Flow is one of, the, sorry, that was a repeat. I was trying to copy. Um, an ancient sophisticated code of laws, customs, and conduct, Ayuk Niska, is a living record of our nation and our and our view of the world. It is the Nishka history that told as told by our elders, the creation of the world, the great flood, the volcano's eruption, the founding of the great families and their crest system the mythical feasts of warriors and spirits, 
and the role of the Niska Sim Gigat Sigidim Hanak Kubawilksik, so our chiefs, our matriarchs, and our young prince and princesses, and the visitors on our lands. Ayuk Niska shows us that every being has the rightful and meaningful place in society, and that we are all interdependent. We need one another. In Niska society, one of the one's identity is symbolized by one ayuk. Uh, crests, which is portrayed on our regalia and the other Wilp uh, family property. So our subcrest is the house that we belong to and or the family. Uh, and the the main crest is usually the house that we belong to. And by our beliefs of sharing wealth in a meaningful and careful planned way. As a part of our statement in the Nishka Nation, our vision states, Nishkan and Lutash Na num will dim hawk ayugum lip al gachum gash yant lip will a lop. Our ayuk, our language and culture are the foundation of our identity. It's the translation for that. So the ongoing history of the Nishka nation is written on the land. The Nishka Highway 113 leads from terrace to British Columbia to our territory, the Nass Valley. And even the highway itself uh, has a significance as that represents the number of years it took us to acquire our treaty. The, the number of years we negotiated with the provincial and federal governments to get back our land. So that is why uh, the highway is called 113, it took us 113 years. En route, visitors travel through some of BC's most breathtaking landscapes, across vast lava, lava fields, past sacred mountains, sunlit alpine meadows, and ancient stands of cedar and hemlock, along with the mighty river Galeaxum Lissums, the Nass River. So you see on the picture here, these are two of the four communities uh, through some uh, helicopter shots that I had in uh, through through my work in our government. So the village that you see on the left, Gitwin Sik, is where I live. So I, I literally live across the street from where I grew up. And on the left, on the right side is Lachkalzap. Uh, it's the third community down the, the the main highway. There you will find our Niskat Museum. Um, as a part of our treaty, we received more than 300 artifacts from museums across the world, and they were sent back to us to, uh, to our own museum that uh, unfortunately is not open for um, sort of safety reasons, but as soon as the, the safety things are taken care of, it will be reopened, and we're anxiously awaiting that. Canada's first Indigenous-led Coast Guard Auxiliary is delighted to, has been delighted to welcome the Niskat Nation to the Coastal Nations Coast Guard Auxiliary family. So the CNCGA was formed for the purpose to protect both mariners and citizens through the forging of strong and lasting partnerships between maritime First Nations. This dedicated group of powerful and not powered by knowledge and sharing through collaboration towards enduring missions of readiness and providing effective marine search and rescue services for people in distress. And with us being a part of that, we also incorporated through our, our Nass River, the, the swift water aspects as well. So we've been developing these, these projects in conjunction with the Canadian Coast Guard and this new new entity that uh, came to be in about 2019, and some uh, just a, a glimpse of the the work which we're trying to develop, so that when people come to our territory and they aren't fully prepared or there's some sort of incident that occurs, we will be able to respond and not rely on organizations that are probably three four hours away from where we live so finding ways to keep people who come to our territory safe the ongoing story of the Niskut nation is written on the land so 
it's been um as you can see through, through the these photos there's been all kinds of activities that have taken place uh this one in particular is a rafting trip uh that we started from as high as we can get the rafts into the water down to uh the lowest community of uh Gingolch. and then the photo that i showed you earlier of gitwin uh this is a, a short hike that uh that you can see basically see the entire lava flow it's a, it's an amazing point of view uh, and it has now been developed as a lookout um, with bike trails leaving from there it's it's slowly developing so bringing in today's theme the traditional lands in general such as our lava bed is a memorial to the thousands of Niska who perished during the volcanic eruption roughly 280 years ago. As such, uh, things like the hot springs are used by our people for traditional and spiritual healing. And even though uh, it's currently open to just uh, local residents uh, with in, in line with the restart plan that the province has established we are planning on opening it up so people can come and enjoy this once again i know it's a, a huge draw there's even apps out there for hot springs across the province and this is one of the the, the, the natural hot springs it's actually quite hot and we have uh, developed a couple uh, hot tubs as well uh, made out of uh, cedar pulled from the land as well and then on the right there is uh, a photo of the actual volcanic uh, cone itself. So there's a, a trail that uh, you can drive a bulk of the way or you can follow the, the actual lava flow itself, but it's a guided tour only in the past before we were able to regulate that specific area. It, the, the cone was actually much bigger but over the years, uh, people going in there, uh, climbing into the cone itself, it's actually uh, deteriorated. So we have guided tours only into there, but it's a spectacular hike. Uh, my fire crew uh, hike that on a regular basis just to keep their fitness levels up. Um, so our rivers, our lakes, our tributaries are traditionally an angosk. So traditional harvesting areas uh, for each wilt. So each each major house within the Nass Valley has a plot of land that stems throughout the, la the, the entire uh, territory, as I'll show you in the next photo, um, of how big our territory is. And the villagers, villages are strategically placed throughout the Nass Valley for seasonal harvesting areas. And obviously, with all the colonialism that occurred, uh, we kind of got Put it in one spot where we typically float between each of the communities based on the seasons. Um, so that's where the four communities came came from, and uh, that's where where you can visit each of them um, probably after the 15th when uh, the province opens up uh, travel a little more and uh, vaccinations start rolling out uh, with higher percentages. So. We are tied to this land, as I've previously stated, uh, since time immemorial, but we welcome visitors to our lands, uh, but it has to be done in a respectful manner. We're always happy to share our rich history with, with, with visitors at our Nishka Museum, uh, as showed earlier, located in Lakhalza, share our nature's bounty with our seafood capital in the Nishka village of Gingolch, where we have a restaurant where you can get fresh crab and halibut and all that fun stuff on a, on a daily basis. Our doors are always open when hosting our Nishka New Year celebration, our Hobie. Uh, our lands are filled with other, other things such as botanical harvesting and fishing, hunting, mu uh, mushroom picking. COVID-19 has prevented us from fully opening our doors over the last year, but we are making plans to, to reopen with the, with, in conjunction with BC Parks and other tourism industry uh, leaders across the North uh, uh, so that we can 
so that there will be a time to come where we can gather and welcome guests to our territory. So proper planning, as, as you heard from the previous uh, presenter, is and proper planning present and preparation is key when coming to our territory. Our weather can change very quickly, catch you off guard. Um, we have about the, the way our mountains are mountains are structured, we have about three or four different areas where the systems can come in from. Um, our territory has various types of lands. So we have the the village of King Coleth right on the ocean, affected by tides. And then we come inland, we obviously have the Gitwin Silk with the um, the lava right on the lava beds broken up by the, the Nass River and then uh, further inland we got all of our hunting areas and whatnot. So like most First Nations communities we do have limited resources when it comes to response. So where you where you planned on going when you can be reached definitely can be things you share as uh, using those apps uh, that, as the previous uh, presenter um, alluded to. Our website, uh, nishkanation.ca, has maps available as well that are geo-referenced. So you, there's essentially search and rescue maps, but when you click on them and you zoom in, um, you can get geo-referenced maps that you can put on your cell phone and with your GPS on your on your device, you can it show where you are on the map, which can be very useful, especially uh, when hunting outside of cell service areas, which we do have here. Uh, and then there may be events uh, going on that you may want to plan around as well. Like uh, throughout the summer, we have events that uh, that go on that are planned through certain holidays and whatnot, uh, certain fishing expeditions and whatnot. So lots of great activities that could occur. Um, so the map associated with this this slide uh, shows our territory that we acquired through our treaty negotiations. Uh, sort of the, the pink slash purple-ish area is what we call Nishka lands and in that you can see the four villages sort of the green areas are provincial parks or reserves uh, and Sort of the yellowish area is what we call the NAS wildlife area. There we have our own restrictions and regulations for hunting and, and fishing. Um, if you're an avid hunter and have been up this way, you would have seen uh, certain restrictions within those areas, uh, usually around the area 630 and 631, 27, all those around Mesiaden and Swan Lake, things like that. And that also includes uh, down uh, the south of it, so along the, the, the United States border. Um, and, and then the larger area that incorporates sort of the, the greenish area, I'm, I'm not familiar with what the colors are, but um, that's the NAS area and we have full resource rights to that. So all of the, uh, tr everything below and above ground for resources, mining, minerals, um, LNG star, or uh, tree harvesting, things like that. So that's sort of a snapshot of our territory, 22,000 square kilometers that uh, came back to us in our treaty. Um, so I wanna thank the organizers for inviting me and allowing me to speak today. Uh, to give you an idea of who we are as NISCA with hopes of more collaboration with Adventure Smart. It has been a great experience thus far. So, Amt Willen, Amt Zabin, Hagwil Hu Willen, Simgit Willen, Di He Hawk Nigim Skagugun, Doyak Signisum Gabeche. Make it the best work you can do. You are doing great. You did very well today. Take your time and work slowly through your life. Focus, pay attention to what you are doing. Be careful. Thank you, that is all I have to say. Any questions?
Awesome. Thank you so much, Anthony, for your presentation. Um, yeah, we have a great question. Do you work with uh, like search and rescue groups um, outside of like Nis the Niska lands? Do you collaborate with others? Yes, we do. Um, we have collaborated with the Bulkley Valley uh, Search and Rescue as well as the uh, Terra Search and Rescue on quite a few occasions and we've tried to get them up here for training and uh with with some of our our especially our fire crew who um typically are in operation during that time anyways um we've also invited them up uh, before the pandemic i hosted a nishka emergency preparedness conference um which in in the we held it for three years in a row up until the pandemic and and that obviously stopped everything um, but we had um, Terror Search and Rescue come in and do a presentation and set up a booth and help them acquire volunteers, recruitment, retention, and all that fun stuff. Uh, so yes, we have done some some work with them and plan to do more as the everything moves forward. Yeah, as the pandemic chills out and we all start to reopen, definitely. And who are your subjects uh, that you would search for or rescue? Uh, fishers, hunters, foragers, everyone? <laughs> yeah, so uh, throughout the, the seasons, we have a lot of um, weekend warriors who, uh, who come to our territory. Um, a lot of them typically come during the fall season. They're either hunters or mushroom pickers. Uh, our, we had, Throughout our whole territory, there's a, a huge abundance of probably 12 or 13 different kinds of um, sellable mushrooms, uh, the main one being pine, but we have uh, lobster and cauliflower and santrales and morales and all kinds of, all that stuff. Um, and we have a lot that uh, get turned around in the, the vast area that we have here or get hurt in precarious areas. Um, and we usually we typically get a call out for them and uh, make a plan either on our own or in conjunction with uh, Terra Search and Rescue or Bulkley Valley, whoever's uh, available at the time, because there's always incidents incidents that occur uh, throughout uh, throughout the year. But there's definitely times where we've had to go out on the water and we um, uh, for search and rescue on on the water or just incidents that have occurred with vessels in distress things like that or um engine breaks on the on the nass river itself where we've had to go out uh, and launch a boat and do a sort of a, a re recovery of the the vessel and uh, the people themselves awesome um we also have um Another question from David. So do you have any development for um, potential attractions for mountain biking or adaptive mountain cyclists in the future? We actually have been developing in, especially in Gitlock Dynamics and Gitwin uh bike trails. So we have developed actually this past fall um, and early and completed early spring, a, a huge bike trail that is in the village of Gitwinsilk and as soon as uh, everything starts opening up around the 15th uh, they plan on being able to open that up. Um, there's uh, various levels of skills and we actually hired a professional trail builder out of the Okanagan to come and help build it for us um, and they've labeled a couple areas as a, a black diamond runs and things like that. I'm not too familiar with the types of runs that are there but I'm assuming it's similar to skiing. Uh, where Black Diamond is pretty adventurous and skilled. Um, but we do have those in the two communities and there's a whole bunch of side roads that are available for that as well. There's uh, secondary access roads off the Nishka Highway that are accessible for hiking and biking. That's awesome. Um, we have another question from Daryl and I'm not sure if this would apply because I'm not sure when your territory is actually kind of close to the public, but he's just asking if you found an increase in inexperienced hikers and outdoors people in the mountains since the pandemic hit. We, we haven't, over, over the pandemic, we have had a few people try to come through but we also had what uh, we hired throughout the pandemic what i called nishka guardians 
And with using the, these uh, staff, we kind of limited the amount of people that came in, especially during states of local emergency, where we were able to actually stop people from coming in. Because um, the area that we have here, we basically have two ways in, um, well, one along the lava beds, obviously towards Terrace, and then one towards the Highway 37. And using those two, knowing that um, we had uh, limited the access from basically midsummer to give or take February, March, and uh, we're able to at least in, in the areas within directly within Nishka lands limit the amount of people that came for recreational use. Uh, with that being said, the 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 area. Um, between our territory and terrace, there's a lot of areas that we would ha we have no control over, and there was a lot of people who went missing in those areas or went out ATVing and gotten themselves in trouble and whatnot. And yeah, it was. Hopefully, we don't have to do that any longer. Um, it's it's very difficult to to turn away um, visitors that want to be want to explore our territory we've typically always been an open door type of uh, community um, uh, even our children have great stories they share with our with guests that come into the into the communities but um, hopefully we can get back to that soon excellent and I have a question from a fellow presenter actually from Dylan and Dylan's asking what's your favorite activity con to connect to the Niska territory ah uh, just, just one. I, <laughs> I know that's probably a hard question. <laughs> I, I really enjoy going out on the water and out on the river, um, going out and getting some crab and getting some halibut, or going on the river itself and getting some sockeye. I enjoy going out hunting um, within our territory. Um, I do try to hike as as much as as possible, but. Uh, um, Injuries over the past few years have prevented that part of it, but um, I, I just enjoy getting out to in, in general onto the land, and uh, especially like like I said, I, it depends on the season uh, what I like to do. Uh, it changes. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, Anthony. Uh, Sandra's going to come on now and introduce our next presenter. All right. Thank you, Anthony. That was insightful, and uh, I appreciate that time you put a lot of detail into your presentation and, and some great information there to share it, it really complemented what Dylan had to share as well so my goodness two of you have uh, hit home runs here so thank you for that and and yeah, you're welcome was, anytime and I, I was updating my slides as Dylan was doing his so that it fit but thank you well done well done you're very welcome yeah and you're welcome anytime and I hope to stay in touch uh, as we move on to our third presenter, last but definitely not least, and another friend of mine, Dave Merritt. Dave Merritt started with Prince George Search and Rescue in 1991. Uh, the 30 years he's decided he has dedicated to the team has spilled into the love of teaching, really, and mentoring the new volunteers that come on to the group. Um, SAR manager is just one of the many hats. Dave does have per permanent hat head, I can guarantee you that one. Uh, leading and teaching since 1998, uh, he's coordinated and run large training exercises from rope, rope rescue workshops to winter response training. The main goal he always strives for is to ensure everyone is ready to go. They're ready to go when they're called upon. Working on many provincial projects and committees has helped Dave to ensure that his passion for search and rescue keeps growing. It's also um, It also allows Dave to kick back uh, to his amazing community, uh, give back, pardon me, uh, and, and that's driven his passion and, and helps with those dedicated volunteers. Dave has also dedicated 20 years to being a volunteer with the BC Cave Rescue and helped build a strong bond between both Prince George Search and Rescue and the BC Cave Rescue in that community. The desire to improve rescue capabilities for Northern BC, Dave has worked hard to improve winter response capabilities and different skill sets. He has mentored many people in safety techniques and avalanche terrain and how to best respond in an emergency. Dave's dedication and commitment has helped build the strength of Prince George Search and Rescue members, has supported his community, all while helping others, all in the name of public safety. 
Again, thanks Dave for joining us. I can't wait to hear what you have to say. It's been a long time since I've seen you. Hopefully we can get together soon. And uh, yeah, the stage is all yours. Here we go. Well, uh, thanks Sandra. Hopefully everybody can see that there. Um, hope that come up. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, I got some up from Sandra. Well, welcome. I mean, uh, I gotta say my fellow presenters this evening had uh, some great information there. I mean, Anthony and Dylan, uh, some 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 great and uh, great insights and and knowledge there that uh, you're gonna hear a lot of that uh, from me as well, but a, a few other things. Um, so I just kind of really want to talk about it's not just Prince George. I want to talk about Northern BC. I just happen to be kind of in Prince George, but there's uh, there's there's a lot of SAR teams out there, and and I really want to put a plug to the SAR teams that are out there. Uh, in, in BC right now, there's there's 79 active search and rescue teams with about 2,500 SAR volunteers. But if you can look at this map and you can kind of see, we classify Northern BC for the SAR perspective, 100 mile house north. We only got 24 SAR teams and we're covering 69,000 square kilometers. Um, so it, it, it's great to hear that Anthony is, is building a great bond out of Terrace there with, uh, with the Nishka Nation because we have these vast areas. You've heard Dylan mention it. And I'm going to mention it again, and Anthony mentioned it. Help is a long ways away, and if you know, that's really what I want you guys to keep in mind is the dedicated SAR volunteers on these 24 SAR teams are. are uh, you know, I've worked with most SAR teams in the province. Um, the dedication in the north with this with the teams here is, is just amazing, and, it, and it's they're, they're coming, they're always there, uh, and they're always giving. Does everybody know how SAR works? I mean, I really want to kind of start there. You know, Dylan talked about it and, and, and Anthony talks about, you know, help being needed. Typically, SAR responses in BC are initiated by our two main, two of our main callers, which is BC Ambulance Service for an injured person um, or a, um, a missing person, which is the RCMP piece. The one thing I do want you to take away from this is the person doesn't have to be missing for 24 hours. That is such a myth. It, it's, it actually causes more grief uh, than anything else. If somebody's overdue, call for help. The RCMP will start their investigation and then they'll hand it off to the SAR team uh, if, if they deem it's needed. They're also gonna start doing work right away. Um, we get rolling fairly quack, quickly, fairly effectively. Every SAR team is slightly different, but they're all dropping what they're doing, coming out to help that person in, in need. And it's the same way with somebody who's injured um they're they're dropping everything they're leaving the families they're leaving their their jobs to to come out and and, and help that person or persons in in need hey dave and, sorry to interrupt here um it, it, it just appears that we are looking maybe at your um presenter notes oh well that's an easy fix i can fix that i hope well now you're getting my presenter notes so i don't really need to talk about anything now do i <laughs> no problem i'm just yeah no problem. I will uh, try and switch that around here. You know how technology works. It worked great when we tested it a couple of days ago. Of course, it worked just fine. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try this one more time here. Still seeing the same thing. Yeah. How's that? There we go. That's better. Perfect. Always got to find the right button. That's Apologize all good. about that, everybody. Technology. Don't worry, thanks a lot. No worries. Thanks for letting me know. I could have gone through the whole thing and I wouldn't have known Sandra. Um, you know, Sandra's our Venture Smart coordinator, and I've known Sandra for, for many, many years, probably uh, maybe not quite as many as Dylan there. But one of the things that we and SAR and and you hear Dylan talk about it and 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 it's is leaving a trip plan. You gotta tell people where you're going. Um in, in my 30 years with SAR, I can remember some uh, some searches where somebody goes, my husband's gone missing. Okay, being the SAR manager, you, you start asking questions. So where did he go? Well, he went east of Prince George. Okay, what was he doing? Well, he was going moose hunting. So basically anywhere from the Alberta border back to Prince George. That was the trip plan that her husband uh, had left for him. So, you know, it turned into a, a three-day search looking for his vehicle, uh, which turned out that we were able to spot it uh, with uh, uh, with a, an, an aircraft, but that's you need to give some detail yeah, in that information. Um, 
you know, like Dylan says, you, you leave it with people you trust. And that's where the Adventure Smart app comes in. Um, but it has to have some good detailed information in there. I'm not going to get into that because that's Sanders Bailiwig there. Take the essentials. Dylan has his essentials. Everybody else has their essentials. Take gear with you because you saw that first map help is there but it could be hours away and it's not because people don't want to get there faster we just can't get there faster um i always tell people if you drive three or four hours into the back country and, and you call us at five o'clock at night uh, in the winter time we're driving five or six hours to get there because we can't fly uh helicopters don't work at night in northern bc um and I, I i hate to say it, it sounds like i'm plugging everybody here but dylan had a had a great piece uh, reliable communications a radio an inreach a satellite communication device i'm going to talk a little bit more about those things afterwards and how they actually work um but having extra batteries for them uh, quite often people take just take a cell phone and it only works from the peak of the mountain and they got one bar Re, you know one bar of uh or one percent left so be prepared for help it's coming um but it isn't instant like the the north shore crew we love those guys dearly but we're not right there at the mountains where people are recreating um some of our sar teams uh i'm going to pick on my uh, my friends in fort nelson and, and fort st john e even in helicopter the three to four hours of flying time to get to somebody in the middle of the province um help is there but you've got to be prepared and, and it was so nice to hear dylan talking about how he's prepared what he has with them and the gear he takes because because it is important um you know crews in the north we we do a lot of flying in helicopters we've got long line capabilities we can rescue people that way but we also spend a lot of time on our quads on the forest service roads missing looking for the missing hunter looking for the missing mushroom picker the gatherer like anthony's dealing with in their neck of the woods you know that that takes time that takes effort and energy so again without good trip plans we spend hours doing it um i can remember a few searches down in and around the anaheim lake area where we're looking for an elder from the community and and we're there for four or five days uh searching for that elder uh and when we did find him he kind of gave us this look of I, I was good for another couple more days i had lots of food and, and i was prepared to be here um so we all kind of gave a good, good chuckle out of that and said okay well let, let, let's get you home to the family but they were prepared to be there and, and we had every resource uh available and and uh for me it was it was it was interesting to see the uh the resources we had uh, i think that was my biggest helicopter bill i've ever handed into the province i think i spent three hundred thousand dollars in helicopter time alone uh which was which was actually quite fun so you're in trouble in the back country you have some of your gear with you, call for help right away. And I'll, I'll talk to you about how an SOS button works on the inreaches um, here in a minute. And, 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 but I want you to, I want everybody to stop. Just stop when you're lost. It's an acronym I learned in my first year of SAR and I, I teach it to everybody who's listening. Stop, just whatever you're doing, just take a breath, sit down and think about it think about the situation you're in what do i have with me does did i leave a good trip plan did i you know bring that essential gear the down jacket my rain gear my tarp my fire starter a little extra food my favorite thing is a dry pair of socks um did i you know what what do i have then observe where am i okay what was my trip plan what did i miss I'm also gonna look around and see, is there shelter nearby me? Is there a good spot to get firewood for an emergency uh, fire tonight? Uh, am I prepared uh, with the group I'm with? You know, maybe I didn't bring the tarp, but my hiking partner did. I'm gonna observe all that stuff we got with us. I'm also gonna observe how my team is doing. How is everybody? Are they in good mental shape? Are they good physical shape? And then build a plan. So, you know, I'm going to build my shelter over there. I'm going to build my, bring the firewood from here. I got water here. You know, plan that and then carry out that plan. Like develop it, carry it out and, and hunker down. You've called for help. Help is coming, but help is also you helping yourself. Uh, one of the reasons there are so many fatalities in certain areas of the province is people call for help and go, help's coming. Well, maybe help can get you. Maybe it cannot. A lot of our winter activities we do in Northern BC, 
we may not be able to get to somebody or you may not be able to get out because it's so late at night there's too much snow there's too much wind there's too much fog the things that are causing you grief are causing us grief and we still have to manage it we're still coming but we may be slowing our time down so do your stop analogy stop what you're doing think observe plan carry out that plan and no help is coming but it don't assume it's going to be there in 10 or 15 minutes it could be three four hours or maybe even overnight so the one thing I want to talk about is and 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 uh, is an SOS device uh, or a satellite communication device like Dylan was talking about. There, there's a couple types on the market. There is your standard two-way device, and then there's the one-way device. All of those go to an international call center in Texas. So when you hit the SOS button, whether it's on a spot or on an inReach or a Zolio device or Bivouac or Backcountry. There's so many different ones on the market now. They go to that call center in Texas. Everything's funneled through there. Then they look at the map and go, well, that's Canada, that's BC. They're going to get hold of the RCMP because that's the international agreement that's in place. The RCMP detachment that's closest will then start their investigation and get a hold of SAR. And this only takes 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, but the big advantage of the two way device is as a SAR manager, I will be able to communicate with you direct. I'll be able to say, hey, what's wrong? What's the issue? Where are you at? How can I come and help you? What do you need? All of those things, I can now start have conversations with you. So when I'm sending teams out or if I'm that team going out, I've got a whole bunch more information. Where when we first started with spot devices, it was just a, there's an SOS in this location. And one of the flaws with some of the early devices were randomly SOS devices. I have no idea how many random uh, accidental SOS calls we've gone out for. Um, I remember going into a hunting camp here about uh, three years ago, flying in in the RCMP helicopter, landing at the edge of camp, and everybody's looking at us, trying to figure out why we're here. And we're like, uh, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but it doesn't matter. I said, hey, are you so-and-so? And he goes, yeah. I said, hey, your, your spot device is going off, sending an SOS, has been for the last two hours. And really sheepishly, he looks at us and goes, I'm sorry, I was testing it and didn't tell anybody and I had thought it had stopped. So great, he tested it, but we still respond uh, as if it's a, a major emergency. And uh, the, uh, you know, it really put us in a pickle coming home at quite late at night. Um, so those spot devices are, 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 are super important because we have a lot of different recreation activities and I, I couldn't list them all. I just grabbed a couple of pictures of some whitewater uh, activities that happen across Northern BC. Some of them very remote. Some of them are very, uh, you know, right in town in some of our towns, but it, it very quickly, something can go wrong in this situation. And we end up getting a kayaker uh, on a log jam with a kayak flipped. Um, as you can see the, the, the one picture that the group's got a, a, a bag on the front of their boat. So their theory is if something happens, they can grab that bag, it's waterproof and it's got all their survival gear in it. We think of these activities, but we don't always think of the safety and the gear we need to carry with us. Again, just picking on swift water because it is one that, that every SAR team in the province uh, in Northern BC uh, gets called out for. And it happens quick and, and we gotta be prepared for that because if we're not prepared, we're not ready to rescue ourselves first, um, SAR teams are gonna come and do their best, but you know, we may not be doing a rescue. We might be, uh, unfortunately, having to do a recovery. So one of the questions that Sandra asked me is, is what have I learned over 30 years? And these are just a few highlights. There's, there's definitely some other things that I'm going to talk a bit more about. Um, but people seem to underestimate trips and the times it takes to do trips. Uh, and, and that is fine. Um, as long as people are leaving a good trip plan behind, uh, it really does help us. If, if uh, I don't know how many times we we get a trip plan handed to us from somebody who's gone out and done it, uh, or is out on the trip, and, and they the person with the trip plan goes, "Here's their trip plan." So, oh, well, we're going to hike, uh, uh, we're going to hike Berg Lake Trail. We figure it's to be done in eight hours. No, that's just not going to happen. So that just gives us an idea that they underestimated their time, and maybe they're not actually in trouble. They just didn't realize how long it was going to take um, or they've gone into a trip that that just well above their skill set uh, and they really shouldn't be there 
so we'll we'll still roll that out so that hasn't changed in 30 years um, one of the things that has really changed in 30 years is the technology um, and how we can share information how we can carry information um, like Dylan I still pack a compass everywhere I go and on my backcountry trips I pack up an old-school paper map yes I have a GPS um, and I prefer to use a, a, a standalone GPS unit because those batteries can be used in my headlamp and everything else that I'm using but when we started 30 years ago with SAR GPS's weren't even something on our radar we, they didn't exist satellite communications didn't exist we were still using maps and compasses and pieces of paper and so were all the people in the backcountry using it um, that has really changed now I just take my smartphone and off I go I download my maps and and, and I'm in good shape it works really really well um, the selfies, the that one picture, the Instagram, the social media, that has really changed. Um, everybody wants to get that one shot. Um, we've talked about, you know, um, my, my day job again, as I, like Dylan, I'm, I'm a park ranger, and we're seeing that in some of our parks where everybody wants that certain spot and that certain shot. And in the last few years in certain parks around the province, it's actually been getting people killed because they, they want to get that shot that somebody else got or they don't understand the risk if they go and do that. So people just need to understand that there's risks in what you're seeing on social media. You're, there's risks in you're seeing what you're seeing in, in mountain biking videos. There's risks in what you're seeing in, in snowmobiling videos. What you're seeing in social media, they don't always show you the risks of those shots. So we're seeing more and more calls like that where people are really stepping out of where they should be. The, the cell phone is, has become the device, which is amazing, but don't rely on it 100%. And, and um, you know, it, it doesn't always work everywhere in Northern BC. There's still huge gaps where there's no cell service in the North. Yes, it's getting better, but you know, it may not work uh, hiking the Berg Lake Trail. Actually, I know guarantee it will not work for you. So people think, oh, my cell phone should work. I'll be able to text my friends. I'll be able to communicate out. The Wi-Fi tree doesn't work everywhere. Uh, and it's just not gonna get there anytime soon. We still get those people that just don't wanna tell people where they're going. And, and I love Dylan's example of, hey, I've got my secret hunting spots, but I'm gonna give it to the guys that, that, that mentored me and taught me. He's still telling people where he's going. He's just not telling everybody and their dog that, hey, by the way, my favorite hunting hole is three ridges over to the left because you know, he wants to protect that, and I, and, and I get that. The other one we're seeing is is because of this technology change, the communication devices, the spots, the inreaches, um, we're seeing more rescues than we are searches, which is great. Um, when I started 30 years ago, I could guarantee we would be doing eight to 10 five-day searches a year. That just That's just how it happened. We spent multiple days searching for people because we get the, oh, my buddy's gone missing. He was out hunting or he's out fishing or he's out hiking. He's driving a, a 1980s Toyota pickup truck. So now we got to find the pickup truck and then we got to find that person. Where today people just hit the SOS button. We know where they are and we can just go and do a rescue. And, and it, it speeds up our time. It speeds up our, our response capabilities, but it also puts a bit more stress on on some of the SAR teams uh, because that is more higher level of skill set that, that maybe we've had to keep up than we did 30 years ago. Um, but when we do get a search, when we do have to search for somebody, they're usually very large, very complex. Um, and we've seen that the last three or four years, searches running two, 300 searchers coming out and uh, we're there five, six, seven, eight days and, and we're, we're, we're we're just giving it all and, and that's all we can do and, and and they're usually very successful but the effort and energy we put into it isn't the same type of search we're doing like I said 30 years ago uh, because it's, it seems to be they've gotten more complex because people are trying to get further and further away from people um, and you know when we do get that search you know we're, we're bringing out you know all the toys all the resources you know this one picture here this is a fairly small search we had 15 20 people out we we searched for maybe three or four hours. We found our we found our subject and, and we rolled home in about four hours versus a rescue now where we can do a rescue with a long line and, and we're in and out in, in an hour, hour and a half. Um, 
you know, I mean, again, we we pick on our North Shore friends, but they they do it right. They're, they've got it pretty dialed. They can do a long line rescue 15, 20 minutes. They're back finishing their coffee that didn't even get cold yet. And and that's just because of the change in technology, the change in people and, and, and how things have changed that even our technology and our, our, our helicopter capabilities. When we started this, when I started 30 years ago, long lining wasn't the thing. And now there's a lot, 11 teams in the province that have the capability to do long line work. And, and there's three of us in Northern BC, which is, is amazing. So it, it, we've changed, we've evolved with the, 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 the pressures of, of, of the user groups. And it's because of the people uh, recreating that, that we've had to evolve and change. And I'm just gonna kind of leave it there, Sandra. I am gonna just plug you guys because the trip app is great. The, you know, uh, the, you guys give great at messaging out there. And, and I, I don't have any more else to say. I can keep talking, but. I kept this one fairly short, just for you. Excellent, thank you so much, Dave. Definitely have a couple audience questions. Um, Mike is asking, there's been a huge growth in mountain running with minimal gear, spare clothes, ultra lightweight shoes and clothing. Any thoughts on this trend? Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, uh, we've been lucky in our team here. It's a huge activity here. We just saw, I don't know if anybody's been following the news a little bit in, in China, uh, they had a, a fairly large, which you're just talking about, a race uh, about two weeks ago, and uh, a freak snowstorm uh, rolled in and killed 20 of the participants in the event. And actually, China just banned it uh, as something that they're not going to allow inside China anymore, which is quite surprising. It is very concerning because a lot of these people, like you say, are, are wearing a thin pair of running shoes, maybe two water bottles, and, and that's what they got with them. And the the concern is is hopefully at least they've got that satellite messaging device because that's like i said earlier it's gonna it's gonna speed up our rescue if you don't have that and and we've got a search for you um hypothermia is gonna be a massive concern and, and most of these runners do not pack anything uh to to protect themselves so it is a concern and and but how do you reach people that uh that uh, in that activity it, it's it is a concern definitely Awesome. Um, you know, just a personal sort of anecdote for myself. Um, I have a running vest um, and, you know, you don't want to put too much weight in your running vest, but carrying two of our emergency blankets, um, I carry two of them just in case. I've got one for myself and one for somebody else if I find them, or I have two for myself if I really need it, um, yeah. you know, if, for some reason. Um, but yeah, just carrying those in your running vest and, you know, carrying stuff in your running vest um, running vests are awesome. They, you know, they, most people can wear one. Uh, we're not at the, um, super athlete level where we're worried about ounces on our us and, and, and shaving off seconds. Um, so wearing a running vest is really, really helpful. Um, like I said, I carry two. I also carry some K tape, um, a tensor bandage, like some things to just stabilize ankles, knees. Um, if I was out there, big gauze pads for scrapes and things like that. Um, so, you know, it's up to us as the user when we're out there to um, sort of, you know, customize our bags and, and for what we're doing. It's a little bit of an investment, but over time uh, you can have multiple bags for multiple activities and then you're kind of guaranteed that your bags are never without something um, because you're always packing those bags. Yeah, and, 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 and you're, you're bang on, Sandra, but uh, the other one I'm going to just plug you there with is you're the converted you already drank the kool-aid to look after yourself where i've seen some of these runners and they haven't quite uh found out that, that, that they can drink the kool-aid and pack that little space blanket to help keep them warm yet so i think the education is coming but by uh, having other runners out there educating i think that's you're right dang on that's how it's going to uh, going to change Excellent. Um, and then we have a question from Peter. Um, he unfortunately missed some of Dylan's section uh, just because he was having audio issues. And uh, what two-way satellite phones uh, or devices are recommended by Dylan or Dave? Or where should we even start looking for one? Well, I mean, like, I mean, I'm like Dylan. Um, I, I packed the InReach. It was kind of one of the first out there on the market. But a couple of the names that uh, that I've uh, we've been playing with is the Zolio device is is a fairly inexpensive one. Um, I'm a big fan personally of the InReach, and the reason I'm a big fan of the InReach is when my cell phone dies, I can still type out a message. It's not fun, but I can still type out a message where pretty much every other 
two-way satellite communication device out there other than the new spot x which i haven't played with you can't send a message if your phone's dead everything goes through the phone and the app on your phone so zolio is a great device but you have to have battery in your phone to customize your message i can still send an okay but i can't give you any information um so but there's like there's a zolio um there's the somewhere uh, device there's the uh backpack i think it's called backpack blue uh there's, there's multiple different devices out there um for the, the 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 that are based on the iridium satellite network which is the uh and then there's the spot network uh which i i don't have a lot of experience with the spot x with a built-in uh keyboard on it but uh you know those, those are all the ones out there and and yeah i don't know i again i'm like dylan i, I really like the inreach it, it works really well for me yeah, that's great. Thanks a lot, Dave. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks again uh, for your presentation this evening and for your time. And I will turn it on over to Sandra and she will be um, signing off and then I will end the webinar. Thanks, Dave. That was good. It's uh, I never get tired. I love listening to our volunteers and their stories and what they have to share. We, we do have curriculum that we share every week, but there's nothing like hearing it. Uh, straight from the SAR volunteers and, and what they do and what they commit and the time they, they spend in training, volunteering during that training, uh, time away from their families. So, you know, the, they're unpaid professionals and the, the thousands and thousands of hours that they dedicate all in the name of public safety out of the goodness of their heart. So thanks again, Dave, for all that you do. Thanks, Anthony. It was a pleasure. Dylan, it's always a good time. Super helpful. And as we close tonight, thanks to everyone for joining us. I, we could see we had a good audience tonight. Appreciate it. If you're interested in more of what Adventure Smart has to say, uh, we, we've uh, we've got weekly presentations that are coming up. So next Thursday is going to be our Paddle Smart program. So if you love to stand up paddleboard, kayak, or canoe, join us next Wednesday. Pardon me, Thursday, seven o'clock. And then on June 21st, we have another special event happening. It's with Stephen Hugh, and he's with the author of Destination Hikes which is really applicable because we're focusing on hiker safety um, in and amongst all of our messaging this year, 50% of all search and rescue, uh, search and rescue incidents are in the Southwest for hikers. We need to talk to the hikers. The hikers need to do a little bit more to be prepared and have some great communications like our guest told us tonight to have that in place. So we're excited to have Stephen Hugh on June 21st. Everything can be found in the same spot, BC Adventure Smart Facebook events page or through the website as well. Thanks for everybody's time. Have a great summer. If you see us at a trailhead, you'll see Natasha, you'll see Scott uh, swing by. They've got some safety whistles, emergency shelters, and emergency signaling cards for you. Spend a little time and learn a little bit more. And uh, all the best this summer and wishing good health for everyone and hopefully fewer search and rescue calls. Good night.